Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our council meeting for Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. It is six o'clock and uh, we're starting right on time, which is amazing. I'd like to uh, start with our traditional land acknowledgement. The town of Midland recognizes it's located on land which the traditional and treaty territory of the Anishinaabek people, now known as Chippewa Tri Council, comprised of Beausoleil First Nation, Rama First Nation, and the Georgina Island First Nation. The territory is within pre Confederation Treaty 5 and Treaty 16 and included within the Williams Treaties of 1923. The town of Midland recognizes it's located on land which is a traditional territory of the Huron Wendat and the historic homelands of the Metis, and that our town is home to a large and diverse community of Indigenous peoples. And I'd like to deliver the following safety message. Should the fire alarm activate, please exit the room in an orderly fashion and proceed to the evacuation assembly area, which is located in the upper parking lot. You may exit through the main entrance, those double glass doors, make an immediate left and proceed out the front doors or through the secondary exit right here behind Councillor Ball. And up the stairs, check the door for heat before opening. And if it's safe, exit on the second floor and turn right and proceed out the front door in front of you. The washrooms are located on the second floor to the left of the seating area and the elevator is located just outside the main entrance. As Midland has a respectful workplace policy, anyone exhibiting violent or harassing behavior will be asked to leave. And for anyone requiring a hearing assist device, please advise the clerk and she will arrange with our IT staff to provide you with the device. It does not slow down how fast I talk though. Uh, council meetings are recorded via Zoom and are posted to the town's YouTube site. The meetings are also broadcast on Rogers TV channel 53 when available. Deputy Clerk, Deputy Mayor. We have Deputy Clerk in the house and Deputy Mayor. Deputy Mayor. Hi, I just wanted to um, speak to uh, Councillor East. Uh, most of you know that he is in hospital. He did suffer a mini stroke. Uh, yesterday, he decided to post something to let everybody know what was going on. Um, but the family does ask for privacy. Um, if somebody visits and they find something out, please don't post it. If you want to know anything or if somebody asks a question, um, go to his page. When he's ready and when he knows, he will post information. Um, the family really would like their privacy right now. And we wish him well. All the, the, the prayers and well wishes are welcomed and they can continue. And I think we should all do that for him. Well said. And I can tell you his dedication to this job, he, he uh, Facebook messaged me, which is how we usually communicate just informally to apologize for missing this weekend's meeting because he was in the hospital after having a stroke and anyway the guy's uh he's a gem god love him um but he seems like he's on the mend so he certainly could benefit from everyone's thoughts and prayers um and with that i'll uh, call for a moment of silent reflection i know mine will be directed towards sheldon this evening Thank you, everybody. Number nine on our, or sorry, number eight, number seven, actually. I'll just keep going backwards till I get a number I like. Declarations of conflict of interest. Council, are there any declarations of conflict of interest relating to anything on the agenda this evening? Seeing none, I have motions arising from our closed meeting discussions that we started at five o'clock today. Motion moved by Councillor Ball, seconded by Councillor Patel. The council receive his information and confirm the directions as outlined in the PowerPoint presentation, verbal report and update provided by staff at the closed meeting session of council held April 10th, 2024 with respect to clock negotiations. Council, we've had our discussion in camera. All those in favor? Any opposed? It's carried. Next move by Deputy Mayor Pro, seconded by Councillor Meredith. The council appoint Michael Osborne as the community member representing the town of Midland for the Southern Georgian Bay OPP Detachment Board, a brand new creation for the remainder of the term of this council. And that myself, Mayor Bill Gordon, be appointed as the town of Midland council appointee to the Southern Georgian Bay OPP Detachment Board for the remainder of the term of this council. Council, we spoke about this in camera and uh, have confirmed this and looking for support. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Uh, next, I'm going to pass things over to Madam CEO for a moment. 
through your worship to members of council and the public. I have the pleasure today of introducing two of our newest staff members. So to my immediate left is our director of HR, Jennifer Manicom, and um, she is on week two. And um, the farthest to my left here is Dana Clark, who is our executive director of digital government and service innovation. So I'd like to welcome them to the uh, town. Welcome, and uh, you'll. I think it's now almost official that uh, this town is effectively run by the uh, the most powerful women in Midland, and uh, we have a lot of similar uh, powerful women on council. And in, again, this just speaks to the diversity that um, all of us seek in in making our organizations and our council representative of our community. So, welcome aboard, and it's great to have you here. There's lots for you to do. Um, We've already set some strategic priorities, and I'm sure you will find all kinds of other opportunities and synergies and savings and service delivery awesomeness for the good residents of Midland that will help support you to achieve. So welcome in to your first meeting, and uh, we'll carry on. Okay, moved by Councillor Patel, seconded by Councillor McDonald, that the contents of the regular council with closed session agenda for April 10th, 2024 be approved. All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Seconded by Councillor Bald, seconded by, or moved by Councillor Bald, seconded by Councillor Meredith, that the items and related recommendations contained within the April 10th, 2024 consent agenda as consent items having been considered by Council be adopted. And before I call that question, Council, because uh, there hasn't been any reports or anything pulled specifically from the consent agenda, this is your opportunity to make comment, ask a couple questions or uh, clarifications on anything that's in this rather uh, large consent agenda that will be passed as an omnibus motion. Councillor McDonald. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I was away, so maybe that's why there wasn't a report pulled. <laughs> but I did get my questions answered. But um, if I may, I'd like to just address some of the concerns that were answered. Well, this first concern wasn't answered because I didn't put it forward. But uh, on item 10.21, minutes of the regular council meeting, item number 17.2, the CSR 2024-32 Young Street reconstruction project, I would like to offer my apologies to staff members because the staff was not given the opportunity to present this report. As our minutes indicate, as the minutes indicate, the rule of a procedure to allow the recommendations be considered separately. Then uh, an amended motion was presented. Our procedures bylaw 16.4 says a motion to amend clearly states after discussion a motion on the floor may be altered by a formal motion to amend. We never got to discuss the original report that was you know, presented before us, and I do apologize for that. And in the future, I hope prevent it from happening again. And I just had a question on the CPIC about why the audit committee, the 2022 minutes were just presented now but uh, apparently they didn't meet again till 2024 to approve them, which makes sense. And then I don't remember the answering the question about the Simcoe County official plan amendment. It was quite a lengthy detailed, and I just wondered if this is routine. Who's got that one? I don't think Mr. Parkinson, is Mr. Parkinson online? Oh, oh, very good. Planning isn't one of my strengths. <laughs> it was boggled. Anyway, they, they can get back to me on that. It's no big deal. Um, and my questions were answered on the year, the year end tax arrears. I, I was curious why we had to keep paying the county and the school board when we don't receive um, the taxes ourselves, but apparently that's legislated. And yes, thank you. That's it. 
we have our planning manager on uh, online right now. Maybe you can shed some light on the OPA. Uh, good evening for you, Mayor Gordon. Um, is the question, could you repeat the question, Councillor, please? Thank you. Um, the amendments to our uh, official plan, amendment number one by the county, March 14th, 24. There was a lot of crosses and is that a routine? Do our official plans get amended routinely? By uh, the through you, Mayor Gordon. So this was a notice of decision from the County of Simcoe in regards to an official plan amendment that uh, Town Council had approved. So this was an approval by the um, by our upper tier, which is the County of Simcoe. And um, indeed, there are a number of strikeouts and things like that shown in one of the schedules to that notice of decision um, uh, as presented in the staff report from um, count, from county planning staff. And um, it, it is fairly routine for them to show track changes. Um, and in the report, the planner does note that some of the strikeouts that they had indicated were uh, just from extraneous text or text that didn't really need to be in the amendment itself. Um, and um, town staff were um, in agreement with uh, with the changes that they, as they did not change the intent um, of the uh, of the official plan amendment that was approved by council. So it didn't cause our planning department any concern, their amendments? Uh, through you, Mayor Gordon, no, we did not have any concerns with the changes proposed. Thank you. Oh, is that it? All right, I've got a couple. Uh, so there's a new policy, um, the routine disclosure policy and active dissemination policy, which our staff created to make it easier to get information from the municipality without having to be redirected to the uh, FOI process and the fees and everything to go along with it. So routine things that don't wouldn't normally fall under the bucket of FOI, uh, we now have enshrined in a policy that makes it very easy for you to request and get those from, from the municipality. Uh, a lot of municipalities you don't have this, kind of channel everything through FOI, even though it's something you could just go on the website and download, it made no sense. So staff proactively uh, came up with this policy to make it easier for our residents to get access, and non-residents to get access to publicly available information. Um, so I got to give kudos. That wasn't a council directed thing. This was just some innovation the staff came up with to make life easier on residents uh, based on feedback at the window. So bravo on that one. And uh, to your point, Councilor McDonald, I apologize to uh, Mr. Sobel after the last meeting because he had a bollard with him and he was really excited to show it off. It was under the table and he had never had a chance to whip it out. And uh, I, I apologize to him after because he was pretty excited to show this stuff. They'd done a lot of work and research on it. So I did drop by his office and uh, apologize for cutting his, his knees off on that one. Uh, it will be back here and it will come again out from under the table. And when that very same report comes back to us, I think the only alterations is going to be there's some costing associated with options, as well as a couple new options that we did in the amendment. So we'll have a chance to fully discuss all of the options. And for the folks that, you know, we're, we're thinking that it's imminent happening, the decisions now, We've got a lot of letters and calls in support for one option or another. Just assure people that we haven't made a decision. We're not saying no to the, the staff recommendation that was in that report for those of you who have read it. Um, it's just that we wanted a couple more options so we could have a full discussion and have everything laid out on the table as it were, including that bollard. <laughs> so we will see that and uh, hopefully you didn't send it back. You still have it? Okay, good. All right, because you'll have that opportunity hopefully in the either the next meeting or the one after, because I know we're anxious to get that report back and get some finality on this so we can move that project ahead. And uh, just a shout out to Huroni Animal Control. This is a little more benign. It's a renewal of our contract, but uh, Randy Bedan has been doing this service, basically a one-man show for ever. And uh, he's the only only guy in town to do this, or any he serves all the municipalities and does it for incredibly economically. And uh, so this is a renewal of the contract, and so I just want a little shout out to Randy and say how much we appreciate him and uh, the hard work. And for any young aspiring animal control people out there, I think Randy's looking for someone to take over the business at some point so he can retire and stop chasing dogs, cats, and raccoons. So if uh, 
he didn't ask me to do a, a job plug for him, but I just say, if you have any interest in that, um, talk to Randy from An your own animal control. At any rate, it's great to have him on. We signed him up for another three years. So those are what their pets run free. Be warned. So we've had our little discussion about uh, everything on the consent agenda. Any other questions? Nothing? All right. All those in favor? Oh, comment, Councillor Meredith. Thank you. Um, just a comment on um, um, the Georgia Bay Cancer Center request for um, um, the fee be to be waived for their uh, annual um, butter tart uh, pickleball tournament, which I'm glad to see it going through again. Um, and also, uh, and I hope to play in that tournament uh, when my pickleball game gets up to up to par. Um, my wife says it's not not there yet. So, uh, but um, also the um, um, the lawn bowling, uh, the Sandy uh, Mason and Friends lawn bowling uh, charity event uh, for uh, hospice uh, Heronia is going on as well, and I, I do play in that one. So. Uh, um, looking forward to that event and also uh, grateful that to, uh, we could uh, um, allow them to, um, um, you know, um, bypass our alcohol alcohol policy um, and um, they can uh, fundraise uh, for hospice. Uh, last year they raised 9000 and hopefully we can uh, raise a bit more for them th um, this year. So anybody who wants to put a team in both uh, in both events can surely uh, find it on their website. So. Glad that that's uh, going through again this year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And if the members of the public have never had an opportunity to go in and check out the Lawn Bowling Green, it's tucked away. It's a little gem. You have to kind of want to go there. You don't stumble across it. It's amazing how well cared for it is. And uh, they're a great group. And I'm not concerned in the least about letting them have drinks while they're lawn bowling down there. They're not a rowdy bunch, but uh, what an amazing place they have down there. And they put this on yearly. So it's it's one of the ways it's a charitable thing when we forgive fees and allow things to happen like that. And it's certainly something we're all happy to do. So, and I think deputy mayor will be there for some opening remarks for that one. Cause I think I'm unavailable. Did I pass the torch to that one or is it me? Maybe it's me. Okay. We get, we get, the, that's one of the joys of council. You get to do opening remarks for things. Something told me I wasn't in town for that. And I was passing the torch perhaps. So we'll double check with you either that or if council Meredith is going to be there with his bowling shoes on or whatever you call them thing. Anyway, hey, I digress. We can just go on all night. I know I can. Anyway, I'll call the question. We'll just keep moving along here. All those in favor. <laughs> Remember what you're voting for. Okay. All right. Moved by Councillor Downer, seconded by Councillor Ball. The council resolve into committee of the whole. All those in favor? And any opposed? Let's carry. All right. Passing the mic over in the chair to Deputy Mayor. That was quick. <laughs> okay, so welcome to the Committee of the Whole. Um, so number 12, we have um, we don't have a public meeting or hearing uh, presentations. There are none. Uh, 14, Integrity Commissioner recommendation report. There are none. 15, deputations and petitions. Um, so we do have two, deput or two deputations tonight. Um, the first one, I'd like to introduce Mr. Mina Fayez Beguet. He's here to provide an update on homelessness and affordable housing programs. And the, this deputation is to be received for information purposes. Welcome. Welcome, Mina. I just want to remind you, you have 10 minutes. Uh, through the chair, thank you and good evening, Council. And, and thank you for giving us the time to, to give you an update on uh, some of the work we've been focused on. Um, as you recall, I was here a few, more than a few months ago, uh, giving you a, a sneak peek on some of the work we were working on the homelessness side. Uh, today's presentation will be kind of a comprehensive um, overview of both the work that we're doing on our affordable housing uh, file, as well as our homelessness services file as well. Uh, right now, there's a few, two documents being handed out. They're draft documents for council members and staff. Uh, as uh, we have yet to publish the final uh, 
product for both, but those should be available to the public in the near future and probably in the next few days. Uh, and I'll, I'll cover what those two documents are throughout the presentation. Um, before I start, I'd like to introduce two staff members that are here uh, to support me with any subject matter specific questions. Uh, John Connell, who's our manager of uh, housing implementation, and Andrea Hersiu, who's our su program supervisor for emergency shelter services, outreach and encampment engagement. So we'll just jump right into the presentation. Um, so uh, for those who don't know, the County of Simcoe is one of 47 system service managers that provide social services here to the 16 uh, member municipalities as well as the two separated cities. Uh, the two separated cities of Aurelia and Barrie have an independent contribution agreement, but through legislation, they're included in our catchment. Uh, which is unique because oftentimes counties are the ones being served by the separated cities, like in London and in Brantford. Uh, but here it was uh, done the opposite. We've been system service manager through uh, a legislation for housing since uh, 2000 uh, through the Housing Services Act or its earlier iteration, which was the, the Social Housing Reform Act. Um, in, in these different legislations, the Ontario Works Act, the Children's Services Act, were given the authority to not only direct service delivery, like to provide direct service delivery, but also to do third party uh, service delivery through purchase of service. If you go through the next slide. Um, so for housing, there's really two distinct roles. One is we're actually the system service manager, meaning we fund and oversee all the different subsidized housing for the last 25 years and every iteration of that housing, um, which includes nonprofits, uh, and and cooperative housing, where we subsidize units in those programs, as well as we are a direct housing provider. So we are also a landlord uh, for affordable housing, where we own and operate um, a stock of affordable housing as well. In both cases, usually this is set to be about the deepest subsidy that is offered um, historically at the province. So it's about twenty five or twenty six hundred uh, in the nonprofit and the affordable housing sector of affordable housing units that we're responsible for, and an additional 1,600 that we directly operate. And that number continues to grow as we continue to develop uh, new units uh, through our 10-year affordable housing strategy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here's just kind of like a breakdown of our affordable housing and the types of housing we offer. Um, really, I'm not going to jump into too much detail, but this presentation is available for all, but it does just try to demonstrate to you the different responsibilities we have and the, the different housing in each of the towns and townships and, and the two separated cities. So as you can see, essentially speaking, for the most part, almost all the member municipalities do have affordable housing units um, located in it. There's only a, a couple that do not. Um, I may be wrong about that. And then there's also um, the two separated cities. So this is just trying to break up to show you the, the size and breadth of where the housing is available uh, by percentage. Next slide, please. So um, I had I had shared with you um, earlier in uh, earlier in the year with my original presentation about our open data strategy. So one thing that we have pivoted towards in late 2023 is launching an open data set that has um, kind of a day by day, night by night data strategy on our homelessness services that we provide in all the towns and townships uh, and the two separate cities, as well as year over year data analysis to show you the progress and, and targets that we're trying to achieve when it comes to how we support people through our shelter, through a shelter system flow data. So open.simco.ca. You can check it every night. You'll see what happened the night before in terms of what's how our shelters are being used, how our um, year over year housing outcomes are looking, and whether or not people are finding permanent housing or not, and what are the reasons for it. Uh, and you can then, you can actually do some further analysis by population, by age type, um, gender, all these different types of priority groups, uh, which is part of our funding structure, both provincially and federally. There's certain priority groups that we have to track data for and show our progress on those. Uh, so I encourage everyone to take a look. We also launched in 2023 uh, and in early 24, some census data tools. So these are tools that take the 21, uh, 2021 data uh, 
pr produced by the federal government census, but allows us to slice it with a context of Simcoe County and the towns and townships. So you can understand your um, newcomer growth, your population growth, uh, your age disparity, all the different census data points, but you can look at it from a Midland analysis or a Midland perspective uh, for us here today. So I, I uh, you know, I encourage you to take a look and see how the town's growing and where kind of the social uh, intersectionality is with the services that we provide as a county. Uh, this, maybe next slide, thank you. Um, the next thing uh, I wanted to share is this is the 10 point plan that we brought forward uh, to the town and to council and walk through some of the things we are planning to do. So I'll, I'm gonna give you a, um, a deeper update on how we've done on these 10 points and in specific to Midland numbers and data points so that you can see where we've made some investments in Midland. And then we'll jump back at the end to our 10 point affordable housing, our 10 year affordable housing strategy and some of the work we're doing specific to Midland as well. So you can kind of see the context of the service manager servicing this town. So of the 10 of the 10 points, you know, a few things have been accomplished and we're really proud of it and a few things are still underway. So the things that are still underway is that we just launched our motel voucher program and expanded program. Motel vouchers are often used for overflow in the shelter systems for particular sizes of households, often households that cannot um, be accommodated in our shelters uh, are usually families or larger household member uh, clientele uh, get to access uh, a series of different uh, motels across the county in order to be sheltered uh, if they're experiencing homelessness until a space is made available or a referral is made where they can find more appropriate housing. So that program just launched a few uh, 10 days ago. Uh, and it's it's really, it's a legacy program we've had. We've just made some more strategic investments as we continue to sign up more participating motel programs so that we could uh, have a varied approach across, geographically across the county. The second thing is our centralized intake, which was one of the 10 points here as well. Uh, this one we're still working on. So this was the one-stop phone number after hours to access a shelter. It is the gatekeeper of our inflow that we wanna centralize our intake uh, rather than have each shelter provider be able to, to govern their own intake daily. We're trying to do it through a centralized model so that there's an after hours place to call if someone shows up at the door of a shelter looking for a bed. And if that shelter is filled, uh, be able to be referred to one that does have an open bed um, and be able to arrange the logistics and the transportation and all those kind of things to get that person uh, into a bed for the night. Uh, even if it's out of town, the idea would be is like you spend a few nights in the shelter that has the available bed and then you're waitlisted to come back to your home community once a bed's available. Um, so we're hoping to have that ready by October 2024. Our goal is to have it in place prior to the winter response in 2024. Um, third thing is the deep subsidy program. So we were able to accomplish this. This was the one of the um, real key things we heard in our in our our consultative review uh, in April of last year is that in order to have outflow from the shelter systems and to have people you know, end their experience of homelessness and enter into permanent housing, they needed deeper subsidies because there was just not enough affordability. So we introduced a subsidy that could range from 600 to 800 to up to 1,000 in certain cases uh, for individuals to take that and layer it with their own um, income support subsidy, whether it be OW or DSP, to garner something around, you know, it could be as high as uh, $1,500 in subsidy for rent making most opportunities that are available possibly affordable by being able to layer that much more um, deeper subsidy. So we issued 162 of those subsidies since last eight, since last July, um, which was 92 over what we expected. So this was helped us move a lot of people uh, that were either at risk of becoming homelessness and keeping them housed uh, because either rent had, was raised so much that they could no longer afford where they're staying or for people who are actually experiencing homelessness on our, our homelessness by name list uh, and getting them housed into these, um, these different opportunities. And this was a regional response done through our, our service partners who do the housing help uh, on the deep subsidy. A um, couple of, uh, if you go to the next slide here to, um, oh, actually, sorry, no, go back. 
I apologize. So a couple of the other parts, we wanted to intensify our outreach out of the 10 point plan. So specific to Midland, we have introduced some different outreach services uh, that have already all been contracted up starting April 1st, and you'll start seeing them kind of engaging those experiencing homelessness. So the exciting that one that we introduced is uh, our, our partnership with Waypoint, the acute mental health um, the acute hospital servicing mental health uh, is going to be conducting our youth based outreach in Midland. Uh, so they're going to activate, you know, a van that, you know, engages uh, either youth who are experiencing homelessness or at risk of becoming homeless uh, with basic need supplies, crisis supports, mental health and substance uh, abuse referrals, as well as try to engage them in housing plans or conversations around housing or entering into, if they're street involved, into our shelter programs to get that service. Um, we also increased funding. Um, again, another one of the 10 points was to increase funding for our base shelter system to make sure that it was adequately funded to operate sustainably. Um, so one thing we had talked about last time I was here is that if the average shelter bread across the 47 service managers is about 25 or 23,000, 23 to $25,000 per bed per year, here at the county, we were significantly underfunding due to the lack of funding we were receiving provincially and federally by almost half, um, or sorry, even more than half. It was around six or $7,000 on average. We were able through a significant increase in funding we received from the provincial government last year to increase that funding. So for example, here, guest house has gotten a significant increase. It was close to about 75%. 50% on its base funding uh, to increase its funding up to about 300,000 and an additional round of funding where we were able to address daytime programming um, and, and give them additional funding in order to be able to staff daytime. Um, so here we're expecting to see daytime and overnight services, staff recruitment and retention strategies, as well as uh, part of the, like, the caveats with this funding is you have to have timely data entry so that our database and our online data system is producing accurate nightly information, as well as for us to be able to now analyze the performance and progress of the, the services being provided to the clients. Uh, Midland Library Navigator. So we introduced the um, navigators, uh, which are basically outreach workers that focus on engaging people who are experiencing homelessness uh, at the libraries. Um, so we put out a call for proposals and we got four um, submissions. Uh, the Midland Library uh, did not uh, was not able to put in a submission uh, on time. However, we're still going to work with them. Um, with some surplus funding to introduce it. This is a pilot program for one year, uh, and we want to expand it to all libraries that have a high population of people experiencing homelessness. And I know the Midland Library was just working on some of its own logistical uh, planning first before introducing it. So this could be a contracted agency that you hire as a library to just have someone, a caseworker that has the skill sets to engage and work with people experiencing homelessness um, and to be able to refer them to the right places or help them with housing plans and or be a direct employee of the library that you want to hire on to do that work. Because it's a one-year contract, I suspect most will be contracting out um, unless they've received independent funding from their town or their city to hire someone, and this would be subsidizing that cost. So we had four uh, successful bids, uh, four for four, four participants and four uh, funding. So we're hoping to study this one-year pilot and then budget it out to be able to be uh, available for all towns. Um, we also introduced a community safety and well-being team that will be engaging the downtown core. Uh, that contract has been signed, so you may have already started to see them uh, walking down main streets and, and kind of where the businesses are located. They'll be very visibly uh, wearing um, bright uh, vests that state the name of the organization, One Community Solutions. Uh, they've been working at a Barry last year, I don't know, a pilot program, and they were the successful bidder to continue working across the county. So Midland's going to have a dedicated team that has also kind of a response model where if you need time to engage or you want to engage someone in, and, you know, you're a business owner or a member of the public and you may not be comfortable or um, have the proper skill sets to engage someone, you can call the number, they'll come out and be able to engage that person for you. And again, referring them back to all the different services that we fund here in Midland or across the county, where appropriate. 
We also, um, you know, invested significantly in Indigenous services here. Uh, so there's two different Indigenous service agencies that will be also doing outreach specifically for those who are experiencing homelessness that uh, belong to or identify um, to different First Nations or other Indigenous groups. Um, and they're going to, again, uh, start recruitment and, and be kind of fully staffed up, hopefully by the summer, in order to start doing that work. And then finally, um, you know, one of the things we worked on together uh, was a homelessness symposium and kind of a community safety and well-being um, event where in the daytime we had a stakeholder engagement session that allowed for all the different organizations that work here in Midland that support these issues that, you know, we're, we're presenting about be able to come up with a toolkit for the public on how to work on these issues from a safety lens from a homelessness and housing outcome lens and just overall community engagement lens. So in front of you is a draft of that toolkit uh, that we've been working with the mayor and Councillor McDonald on and uh, a few of the agencies that were uh, participating that day have all given feedback from that day, as well as a one pager kind of quick referral um, you know, uh, document that you can just look for the number of the, the agency you're, you're needing help with and give them a call. Uh, for whatever the issue may be. Both will be made on, li online and the one pager will be like a live dashboard that updates the information as it constantly changes um, or adds on to it. So that's what's been taking us a little bit wrong to take it from draft to live is to make sure we have the, the tool to publish it regularly on, on a monthly basis, the information would be verified and updated. So you're not calling a number that doesn't exist or an agency that's no longer funded. Um, you know, and then and then again, you know, just to like give you a summary on maybe the next slide, please. So just to give you again another summary of, of the funding that we've put in Midland on the homelessness side, you've got two emergency shelters being funded, uh, a men's shelter and a women's specific shelter. Um, we have an additional transitional housing program that's been funded as well as the four outreach programs. Um, and again, you're seeing additional funding in all of four of those areas and an increase in all four of those areas. Um, you know, just to give you an example, in terms of our transitional housing program, we funded a 10 bed program in shelter now, um, and this is net new. Um, while we're still looking for more supportive housing services, we're in currently engaged in reviewing a few opportunities that will help significantly increase um, supportive housing programming, uh, including, um, you know, negotiating with Waypoint, a larger partnership that would do the support and, uh, and clinical care work uh, on, on those beds. So um, probably a third presentation to council will be coming, uh, hopefully in the next few months with some, some definitive uh, decision points on how that program will look. If you've been uh, following the news in the provincial budget, there was significant money put towards supportive housing for those experiencing homelessness. So we've been engaging Ontario Health on how do we work with the waypoints and other service, supportive service providers to uh, ensure that funding uh, stands up at least, uh, we're looking for at least 100 supportive housing, supportive housing units across the county. And uh, we find that Mid Midland would be logistically a really good place. Uh, to give you some perspective in terms of our by name list, those are the name by name people who are prioritized experiencing homelessness in a county. Of the about 1,000 or so, 151 reside in Midland or use a, a Midland address to identify who they are. So that kind of gives you an example of Midland kind of places third in terms of the towns and municipalities in of need of support for services. And that's why the investment is reflective that we are investing significantly in, in this town. Next slide, please. Um, so the Housing First program, I spoke a little bit about it. This is where we engage those experiencing homelessness with not only rent subsidies, but supports. And it's done through a regional response. So not only are you getting the list of the direct services uh, that we fund, but these are the services that are funded for the whole region who serve people from Midland as well. This is an example of the deep subsidy or other housing or housing support subsidies that are offered through these programs. And I know I'm probably running out of time. Um, the last part here is like, there's a little bit of data on the presentation on the next slide. Um, 
you know, that kind of shows you how many people from Midland are served through these regional programs and then how our HIFIS, which is our homelessness information system, uh, captures those interactions and how, how people are succeeding or progressing through those services. Um, again, you see here, there is some significant support directly to, to individuals experiencing homelessness in Midland. Um, and then finally, um, you know, this is the symposium piece I spoke about on the next slide, and I've shared the two documents uh, for you to take a look at in draft format, and we're hoping to have those, um, you know, up and available to the public as soon as possible once we just fix the, um, the online live information sharing piece. I, at this point, we work closely with the town um, and, and the mayor and, and Councilor McDonald on vetting the information and making sure it reflected the day's um, contributions and, and engagement pieces. Um, and then if we could just jump to maybe the, the what to expect in 23-24 piece, I'll come maybe a second to last slide. Yeah, right here. Um, again, like we've talked about developing more partnerships in 24. So that's been a big focus of ours. You know, the, the partnerships like Waypoint and others, uh, we're in the process of trying to broker as many health-based partnerships in order to layer that service into the social services. Traditionally, service managers do not fund or are not legislated to fund any type of health service. But what we've been trying to do is to layer our common clients um, and cross-reference them so that we know if they're engaging the emergency health system or the justice system and our emergency shelter system or housing systems, that we're uh, layering the services that they're funded to do correctly to find efficiency. Um, so that's been our strategy for the, for the last few months. And throughout the year, you'll start seeing announcements of different partnerships being struck to try to support um, the same cl common client. Uh, and then finally, um, the rapid rehousing supportive piece uh, before we jump to questions, you'll see in the next few months, we're introducing more modular shelter and housing programs that will allow people in the warmer months to participate in a 120 day rapid rehousing program, taking low acuity people who are chronically using shelter beds into this program 20, 15 to 20 at a time and trying to get them permanently housed within those 20, 120 days. And then going into the winter, that facility will then be converted into an overflow shelter or warming and cooling programs, whatever each community needs. Um, we, we piloted this in Barrie last year program was quite successful, about a 90% success rate in permanent housing outcomes within the 120 days. So we're certainly uh, re-engaging uh, to do that. So there's a couple more being purchased as we speak and arriving. One of them uh, arrived yesterday in Aurelia and is being pulled together. The other two, uh, we're still working on locations. Um, and our hope is to get a fourth one, depending on some of our other um, active uh our other active locations that we're looking to make some investments in, uh, this could be an option for Midland um, in the alternative if we don't find something more appropriate in terms of the supportive housing model physically here. Um, so this is uh, kind of everything that the service manager has been doing on both sides. While we're doing all this, we're working on a 10-year affordable housing and homelessness strategy. We just closed our call for proposals for municipalities. And this is the strategy that develops new affordable housing across the county. Uh, we just finished our last 10-year uh, strategic plan. And this is a legislated plan that's required in order to continue receiving funding from the province. Uh, so we plan to have that plan in place and approved by county council uh, now in 2025, as instructed by the province, they want us to slow down a little bit until they give us further guidance on the plan. Um, but I was happy to see that the town did put in a letter of intent to participate in and try to collaborate with the county to create some affordable housing here. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll have decisions made on those uh, in the next uh, week or so. Uh, and you'll probably be getting a call telling you uh, how you did on that proposal. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Ball. Thank you. Uh, I'm always impressed by your team. Every time you come, every conversation we've had, uh, I think that you're in the right direction in all ways. Uh, working collaborative collaboratively, I appreciate that you have opened that up more and uh, to hear more partnerships and that that's 
something that you're targeting as well in the future. I think enhancing programming obviously is the goal and without duplicating service so that everybody is meeting all their needs and able to do that in the best of their ability working collaboratively. So I appreciate that a lot. I'm glad to have this tangible copy here. Uh, it's really well done. I think it's going to be great for the community. It's very easy to read and it's very easy to get the information, especially the last few pages with all the services that are available around town. So I appreciate that so much for you coming up here. Uh, I'm just wondering for the funding for the Midland Library, uh, the one year contract, is that happening this cycle or is that something that is going to be discussed since they, uh, I'm not sure what happened there, they missed the deadline to get that funding. You did say you're working with them though. So I'm hoping that this is for this cycle and I have a few more questions after that. Sure, uh, through the chair. Um, yeah, I, I think what we wanna do is is launch the four first and then um, we, we're we trying to manage some funding in order to find uh, a fifth option for, for, for Midland. So our hopes are to, to have something in place before the end of the year. We're funded fiscally. So technically April 1st is the start and it goes all the way to March 31st. We, we tend to know more in terms of our surplus funding towards the last the last quarter of the year or towards the end of the third quarter, which would put us somewhere in the fall. Um, so I think we'd have more of a definitive decision, but we're working, we're going to continue to engage them. We engage them at a, um, like a steering committee, a table of all the libraries throughout the county. Um, so we'll continue to engage them and probably work something out. Uh, it's just right now when you're fully allocated on April 1st, it's tough to make that commitment. But I think closer towards the end of this year, we should have some clarity on how we can, we can support them. Okay, thank you. And my next question, um, the One Community Solutions, uh, you talked about them walking around. I know we've had presentations about it in the past, but then you mentioned that people can call them if they have issues. So I'm wondering if they're actively walking around or if this is an on-call type of situation that we're being funded for right now. So, uh, through the chair. Uh, so the first, um, the first review of the town of Midland was done the night I was here, which was a very cold night, if I remember correctly. So they didn't find a lot of outdoor presence, which they normally did. So we, we were waiting. So what we're doing is beginning April 1st, there'll be a, a call response model in place. And we'll be publishing that number once they set up their logistics, like their vehicle, like how they're going to respond. Uh, that should be coming any minute now, uh, probably in the next week or so. Thereafter, once the weather warms up just a little bit more and we finish our winter response, which is ends on April 30th, um, they'll probably do another community-based assessment to understand where the hotspots of um, outdoor engage like outdoor presence is, and then design something more appropriate. Based on the first uh, review, it, it just didn't justify it yet. So we didn't want to um, fully fun from day one with them really not having a lot of uh, insight until they are uh, fully informed. So first a patrol, like a, a call response model. Secondarily, but once the weather warms up a bit, we'll probably design a patrol as we go. They will probably do some safety events, some like community safety walks at night with members of the BIA, things like that, to start getting a better sense of the town and its needs. Thank you. I definitely uh, drove downtown at 7 a.m. this morning and there was a lot of needs. So I'm glad Warm. to hear they'll be yeah. coming back to have an accurate representation. Um, and I'm also just wondering the housing first data, where that comes from, I guess the program that comes from, is that just for people that are using a service with someone clinical or is that um, just drop in services as well? And also the median household income. I'm wondering if that's done for a year round residents or if that included seasonal as well uh through the chair i think um for the answer to the for your answer to the first question i i, I believe for um for here in, in the town of midland uh the housing first data is based on client caseload so it, it's clients who are engaged in the program off the by name list receiving support so they've already uh, been attached to a caseworker and here's what's the outcomes and how they're going. Um, housing resource help is is just drop in, coming in to get help or to get on a housing plan. And if you qualify based on your level of acuity for housing first programming, which requires like a level, a higher level of acuity that requires you 
to need additional support to be successful in your housing outcome, usually like supportive housing programming, uh, that one, it, once you qualify for that, that's where we get that data from. In terms of the median income average, quite honestly, don't know and yeah. So what what I'll do is I'll I'll engage our Ontario Works team who probably builds that data point, and yeah, and, um, and then maybe send send an update on that as well. Thank you. Yeah, just in terms of having accurate funding for the community, I mean that's a, that's a high average median. Um, that I think maybe yeah maybe if that's having seasonal in there as well, um, as well as that's a problem with finding data. Um, when there already is somebody on the case circuit, I know I'm sure you're well familiar with that, but if there's any, I guess, plans to get data, I know that was an issue uh, with having drop-in services. There are people that are managed at a crisis level when they come in and they're offered that support to prevent them from, you know, food sustainability, food programming, um, housing supports, but they don't have a caseload. So that's not an accurate representation. So I'm, is there any way to be able to get that data as well? Is that in your plans? Uh, through the chair, yes. So one thing I forgot to share in our in our um, in my presentation is any um, serviced area that's working on homelessness has been required to enter data points into our HIFAS system. So the library, for example, part of the condition of the funding is that you enter HIFAS data. All of our housing help, all of our outreach all of our shelter systems, all of our drop-ins. And now, in fact, we've actually, we did a micro grant for community services. So food security often is those grants. So a few of the the, the local food banks applied and got funded. And again, in condition of, of the funding, they have to enter data points in HIFIS. So if you are know you're supporting someone in a food bank that's experiencing homelessness, we're trying to capture that data to get a holistic um viewpoint of of that of the person and all the different supports they're receiving throughout the county so uh we're hoping that rich data will start giving us a better profile of of the client thank you and once again i appreciate all your hard work i know it's a tough issue but your team is tackling it really well so i really appreciate you coming yeah we have, we have a great team absolutely councilor patel Thank you. For Deputy Mayor, uh, I'd just like to ask uh, about the portal. There's a lot of good information on there. I studied through it multiple times. The only question I had was, um, there's only day-by-day -day data. Is there a place I should be looking to get like a monthly report or a yearly report on the emergency shelter and the motel voucher program data? Uh, th through the chair. Uh, so uh, because we started the the portal last year, aggregate, aggregate annual data will be available this year. So uh, probably sometime in October, would, when we have a full kind of calendar year, you'll start seeing the aggregate shelter use data, motel voucher uh, data. If you go to the, um, the second um, dashboard, uh, in, on the open.simco, there's like kind of four icons. If you click on that second one, you can do year over year analysis, but starting again, 2022 is our first full year of data collection. So 22 versus 23, 23 will be now compared to 24, but it doesn't give you nightly use. It gives you bed, bed usage by agency and by priority group. So youth, or you can slice it by youth, gender, families, um, I think veterans and um, um, and indigenous. So you could kind of do some year over year comparisons, but you won't get daily night, uh, the daily night use annual aggregate until we have that one full year of capture. Thank you. Uh, through chair, I just uh, wanted to see if it was possible to get the monthly data as well, just not yearly. Uh, through the chair, I th I think we can engage our business intelligence team to see how we can uh, publish the data on a monthly as well as a different um, layer to the to the dashboard. So I'll uh, I don't know how long that takes, uh, but I I can certainly look into it. Thank you, Councillor McDonald. 
welcome. It's always good to uh, have you present to us. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I know as soon as we're finished, I'll have more. So hopefully I can forward them at a later date. Um, the expanded motel voucher program, um, that number wouldn't be on here. How would someone reach out for uh, assistance on a particular evening? Uh, through the chair. Um, so the motel voucher program is done through um, the shelters. Uh, so at currently, and when we have our centralized um, intake one point of contact number, they would decide whether the client is eligible for a shelter bed or eligible for a motel voucher. Um, and depending again on household size or fit. Uh, so for example, fit may be, you know, um, somebody with uh, an accessibility issue that the current shelter with the available bed can't can accommodate, then they may be eligible for a voucher. But each shelter makes those decision points. Um, and uh, we're trying um, to pilot possibly putting some motel vouchers in the hands of outreach, um, especially on on extreme weather nights, in order to get people inside and safe when there's you know no space or no warming spaces available. Just to follow up, perhaps you might consider um, uh, as a treasurer of the St. Vincent de Paul, we provide hotel motel payments for some clients. So maybe we can work together on, on that, you know, doing the intake. And as a matter of fact, we had a lengthy discussion about a family today. So uh, yeah, through, through, I, I through the chair, I work, you. again, uh, you know, I've been, you know, our, our staff team, when we came together, we we want this year to be about partnership development. So I'm happy to explore any other agency doing the work. Mm -hmm. I do know the only other non-shelter agency that does motel voucher currently That's is in the city of, of Aurelia, um, the victim services uh, agency that supports uh, victims through justice programs, uh, does, does the after hours motel voucher um, allocations for us and I'm not sure like it's a very small program but um, but certainly excited to to see who else is doing it out there <laughs> I scribbled so much here I don't um, and then the the deeper subsidy accommodations program is that also accessed through the shelter now or how does one access that program? Then the only other question I have is um, that I'll put forward at this moment is the, the call response model. Will that, once they're working, will that number be made available on this sheet or that's why it's a live document sort of thing? Uh, yeah, through, through the chair, um, Empower Simcoe is the regional um, um deep like subsidy provider uh provider for both uh the community based subsidy and the housing first subsidy uh so they would be the agency that does all the housing help work uh and it's by referral so like uh basically what happens is you're attached to a caseworker who continues to working on your housing plan when you're housing ready they make the referral and empower Simco helps start to support you in finding uh, a housing option and then layers in the subsidy based on your income and, and some of your other needs. Uh, so that's who does it regionally other than for our indigenous groups uh, and in South Simcoe, it's contact for South Simcoe and different agency doing the same work. And I think it's uh, that does it for the indigenous groups as well. So Proc, I apologize. Proc is the agency that does it for indigenous. So, so those are the three. So it would just be calling in or working through your shelter uh, who is supporting someone to be referred or outreach can refer as well. Uh, so the client has to be referred in. If they walk in from the street and looking for housing resources, they would also be like taken up that way. And Power Simco works out of our shelters um, and does office hours in all the shelters. So it's easy for someone who's experiencing homelessness using the shelter system to engage them. Um, the second question in terms of one community solutions, yeah, we'll make the, a number available for the short term response. But once we go to a centralized intake, we kind of want to have one number. You call if you're looking for a shelter bed, if you're looking for outreach engagement, 
you're looking for community safety support, you just call the one number and that dispatches to the right agency to, to connect with you or, or connect you straight to that agency. And just uh, my last comment was, if you would have been downtown today, you're, you're, you said that the last time you were here in the winter, there was no evidence of any need. There was definitely evidence of, of need there today that I experienced personally. And um, I look forward to work, continue working with the county and finding solutions that will provide some relief for everyone. And that's why it's so important that we know we get them engaged in registering with Empower Simcoe and all those things. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Marinus. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Prost, through you to Mr. Fayez. How are you today? I'm good, thank great. you. Nice to see you. Um, great uh, presentation. Uh, it's it's um, great to see the strides strides we're making and the, the positive, uh, um, you know, um, positive outlook of uh, of the of the plan. Um, so, in in commenting, um, as Councillor McDonald stated, like today, if you if you went out there and the weather's getting uh, a lot nicer out there, um, and it's not just today; it's two weeks ago. Or I've been getting phone calls um, from some residents uh, that do their daily walk downtown and so forth. So, um, and I'm sure I'm going to get some some calls and the rest of the councillors um, by uh, business uh, community as well. So, uh, which we haven't yet. So, but I'm sure their uh, concerns are there. So my question is, and I was just talking uh, today about this, um, um, not only with uh, colleagues here, a few of them, but uh, some uh, uh, residents. Um, in the downtown core, um, when we have, um, you have outreach, starting. So in the downtown core, we have um, um, uh, people congregating in um, around vacant buildings. It's it, it's become it, it is an issue. Um, and it's it, it, it hasn't just started this year. It's in, in, last year it was an issue as well. Um, contacted our bylaw department. Um, nothing really got uh, um, solved because um, they were kind of on a private property. Uh, but now that it's kind of flowing onto the sidewalk. So, so is that the responsibility of would it, would an outreach come in to play in, in if they're walking the streets, is, would they handle that situation or would they like, how would that, that would, that would uh, play out through the chair. Um, so, so yeah, like I, I think there's a couple of clarification points of clarification. One, when I said the night when there wasn't people on the street, doesn't mean that there isn't people. Our data clearly shows, as I shared, the larger, the third largest uh, uh, group of people on our by name list is identified from Midland. The by name list does not mean every single person, like the 151 are all street involved. Some homelessness is defined as someone without a permanent uh, residence or address. So it could be someone who's couch surfing, someone who's seasonally homelessness. Uh, usually in this area, you find a lot of people during the winter kind of paying month to month or week to week in different residence. And then in the summer, you know, coming out of those residents and encamping and doing things like that. Um, and or people who are street involved or staying in shelter. Um, that being said, Certainly there's a need, and that's why we're investing in One Community Solutions. We just want to make sure we customize the program correctly so it doesn't underserve or overserve uh, the community because it's still a funded program, and we want to be efficient with that funding. Um, so to answer your question, though, street outreach is different than One Community Solutions. One Community Solutions engages people for safety and well-being. So it is there to refer people who may be um, participating in unsafe behavior or creating unsafe um, areas like discharging uh, paraphernalia incorrectly. One, one Community Solutions picks up that paraphernalia and makes sure it's disposed of safely, engages the person that may have disposed it incorrectly, and walks them through kind of the process of the things to do. They do go to hotspots. Um, it's a question about entering private property and things like that that they're not supposed to be doing. But if it's like a parking, a public parking lot stairwell, the steps of a public library, a building like the one we're in on the steps, they will certainly engage. Uh, parks and areas where you know people congregate, that's where they'll engage. Again, 
in an effort to build a relationship with the individual in order to get them uh, to uh, re receive the referrals they're offering and take them up on it. Our, our community outreach programs are, sh are homelessness-based programs that engage people that are experiencing homelessness on the street or encamped to get them to come inside and work on housing plans. Uh, and there's, like I said, four different kind of outreach uh, teams working on four different areas, uh, uh, four different types of populations, indigenous youth, um, uh, adults, um, and two, sorry, two different indigenous groups, one youth group and one, one adults. Uh, that being said, they're the ones that would engage someone that may be experiencing homelessness, a regular face uh, repeatedly to try to get them inside. They often offer supports, uh, whether it be you know, a bottle of water or a referral to an agency or getting them to a foot care clinic if they're in bad shape or calling in a, in if someone's in crisis to an emergency service. Um, so yeah, the expectation is for both groups to be actively engaging clients so that we're constantly trying to refer them to the services available to them. Thank you. Um, just to follow up. So what I'm actually trying to get to is, is, is an immediate solution that um, the impact it has uh, on um, our downtown and it and, and it, it kind of comes full circle back to the county because um, our downtown um, merchants, uh, visitors, residents, um, the more they're downtown, engaged in downtown, uh, supporting the downtown, uh, businesses thrive. Um, when they thrive, the county gets taxes, empty buildings, we're not getting, well, to a point, they're still getting their taxes, but we want to be successful uh, in our downtown. Um, so I get a phone call today. What's the solution of, of uh, a neighboring business has a complaint? And the complaint came in today from a residence, actually, so not even a business. So the immediate solution to uh, engage and move along um, that um, these, you know, it's like a picnic on the sidewalk. Um, and it, it, it may, it, I'm not saying it may be homeless. Some may, they may not, not be, but I'm not sure. They have nowhere to go. They're just around um, uh, whether they're, um, you know, um, begging for change, so forth. So what's my response as, uh, you know, we've had many conversations as, as, uh, in the BIA with the BIA rep and we're, the BIA wants to help out, right? So um, do we, uh, and this resident actually said, you know, is there a community involvement that can get involved and help clean up the streets and, and the garbage left behind and, and so forth. So we want to be proactive and, and help out uh, as, as best we can. So, but I'm just, I'm looking for, because the, the very first, one of the, the calls here, um, I think for garbage was, you know, to, to our, our bylaw department, right? Um, and so forth. So, but our bylaw department can't, uh, go on private property in an alcove. Um, so I'm trying to, you know, my answer is I don't have an answer. So, so I'm yeah. trying to find the answers through, um, through this program. Yeah. Th through the chair. So again, like, again, as a system service manager, we're, we're legislated to provide and deliver services that serve people experiencing homelessness. Uh, if a, if an outreach team, uh, is engaging someone and checks through the data system. Yep, this is someone on our by name list. This is someone who maybe even not on our by name list, but is experiencing homelessness. All the services that we fund are designed to engage that person and, and assist them. Someone is not homeless and just hanging out. It's beyond the scope of our responsibility. I know that's not the answer we're looking for, but our community services side, which is the side of the business that's not legislated, but the county still does, uh, will fund things like the library um, engagement person. That's something that we have no role in, but we're funding it because it intersects with the services that we provide. Food security, um, safety and well-being. So the toolkit that we're designing is an information kit that tells the regular you know, per member of the public, here's the services that are offered and here's who to call. 
it's a bit of a campaign, but things like one community solution in the in their title, the word community. So they're trying to engage not only those experiencing homelessness or who are street involved, but the community around them. Uh, so community safety walks, community cleanups, those are all things they participated in Barry. Um, you know, I, I forgot to, to mention, they're also trained to intervene in crisis for overdoses and things like that. I think they saved six lives uh, last uh, in the summer of last year. So yes, so those are some immediate solutions when it's someone within the scope of our funding model. If it's on private property or in, in areas that require bylaw or um, public domain and things like that, we work closely with the towns to engage. So if there's an encampment, that's where you'll see a collaborative effort where our outreach team, maybe our community safety team and the bylaw officers are engaging that encampment to make sure it's safe, to make sure that the person has supports or referrals, and then to work with them on a referral to a shelter so that the encampment can then be addressed. Um, and there's a process and actually a protocol we have in place that we we used in other towns and cities. So those are the kind of immediate things that we'd offer. Um, but I do wanna be very clear, like uh, immediate things to do don't necessarily change the results usually results happen over long periods of engagement where you've built this trust with the individual to have them accept services. We have no authority to force someone to go anywhere. Um, we can only constantly refer them to the programs bailed. And I just want to make sure that's clear because, you know, we don't want to be sharing with the public, oh, just call this number and they'll take care of it. We'll try to, but if the person just says, no, I'm going to sit on the sidewalk, at that point, there's not much more we can do into forcibly removing them or anything like that, right? And I threw you, Deputy Mayor, and, and I totally understand that. Um, um, it's kind of a double-edged sword, so we'll have to wait, work through it. Um, an another question is, with, with the increased funding um, uh, much needed uh, for the guest house shelter, um, are we seeing, um, uh, and you, you said there's daytime staffing now, is the shelter now open uh, during the day? To 20, like, but not 24 hours, is that correct? Or is it Open 24 hours, yes. Uh, so it's funded now, um, and, and this is something we we heard clearly from both the shelter and, and um, you know, members of, of council and, 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 and town staff. You know, we sat down with our partners and we said, tell us what you need. And uh, they've explained what they needed, and we're, we're working with them closely. Uh, we're also working on making the shelter accessible, and there is a, a couple of renovation projects that now our housing team has stepped in to help project manage and advise on to speed up the outcomes because uh, those have been delayed to, to no one's fault uh, directly involved. Um, so we're working on solutions. Um, and I, I have to say, uh, over the last 12 months of engagement, there's a considerable um, stabilizing outcome that we're seeing. Uh, so we're not seeing service disruption. We're actually seeing a lot more support throughout uh, throughout the day and night, um, and you know we're we're putting pressure on the other regional services to layer into the location as well. So you'll start seeing the waypoints outreach using it maybe as a way to uh, triage their their transport things like that. So there's on site uh, additional presence on site. Thank you. And then so when you speak of the renovations, or the, is that the transitional housing that's going to be happening happening at the guest house or is that even come, um, come or is that coming through the chair no uh the okay. first step is getting accessibility elevator uh in place and and finishing up some of the renovations once that's done we're going to explore um a supportive housing model so that you have some kind of matriculation from shelter bed to supportive housing which will open up more beds but we won't take that on until the, the physical space is ready and a partnership's in place, which we're working concurrently on. We'll come back to council uh, with an update before we enter into any type of outcome, uh, just to make sure that it meets, I think there's some current settlements and decisions we'll have to address in order to make the program work correctly. Thank you, and, and then, sorry, one last uh, uh, area is uh, concerning the library. With, with, with the, um, the social services that the, the the library library provides and and being a, a safe space and our library is not a safe space because we, we need 
it's supposed to be a safe space, but we have security. Now with the, the guest house shelter being open 24 seven during the day, is there still, uh, there will always be a, a need for the library social services, but is there any way because our, our, our library is so close to the guest house, is, is there any way of implement, implementing a shift over to the guest house to take on that responsibility? Uh, through the chair, I mean, the, the purpose of having more funding in place is to offer daytime opportunities. Um, but to be reasonable and objective, I don't think someone in the dead of summer being asked to spend 23 hours indoors in the same place is, is going to want to do that. So I do think like going to the library or going outside and, and exiting the shelter is, isn't human nature of being able to not be cooped up in the same place uh, 23 or 20, you know, 22 hours of the day. So certainly we will have programs available so people can engage. Um, this is where the supportive housing model kind of works a little bit better. If people have more private space to, to enjoy for themselves, they may not rely on on spaces like the library and others where there's less noise and and distraction. Um, so I'm hoping to see maybe some improvement, but we do want to layer service in the library anyway because there's the the guest house has a finite number of beds and program space, and there may not be a you know there may be more people than there are are spaces for them to accommodate during the day or at night. So this is a opportunity to engage those who do not want to enter the shelter system or not use the, uh, the drop-ins to capture their information and their needs so we can kind of engage them independently, maybe through outreach or through community safety work or, or something else. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I, and I certainly do not expect them to be to yeah. 23 hours in one, in one space. Let's get that clear. But but it does give me a lot of answers. So when I get the calls, um, um, you know, I have the information and I can pass it along, but thank you very much. And, and just to share one last thing, the county is always available to help answer questions too. So if there's something that uh, is unique or an odd situation and it, none of the services seem to be able to address it, certainly reach out, uh, you know, and our, our county team can be made available to engage directly or work with the town or, or anybody really on, on an issue of concern. Before I pass the floor to uh, Mayor Gordon, I just wanted to thank you for this good news presentation. It, it's really nice to know that we have a path to start moving forward. Mayor Gordon. Thanks, thanks, Mina. It's awesome working with you and your team down at the county. Um, and I can tell you the work that you've put into this uh, is was fed directly by our community stakeholders and the members of the public that came out to our community safety symposium that we hosted in October. And all of that information was aggregated. You guys heard it loud and clear. You've heard council's uh, concerns. You've been receiving the same emails that we get to a large degree or the summaries of them. And uh, I got to give props to the provincial government. I mean, Midland is, you know, a speck on the list of uh, homelessness problems in the province, but it's it's our, it's our a big speck to us is where we live. And the funding has been coming from the province flowing through you, and you have a lot of hungry mouths to feed right half a million people to serve uh, through the county and midland surprisingly or maybe not surprisingly is you know third in need when it comes to homelessness at seconded to who's one and two aurelia comes yeah it goes uh barry aurelia yeah uh and then midland and then south simcoe as a cluster would be the remainder so the people that feel uh, Midland seems to have it's a disproportionate share of people experiencing homelessness or in need aren't wrong. You have the, the evidence is there. And consequently, as I alluded to many times, it's a blessing and a curse. We have amazing uh, support programs in our community. We have our proximity to Waypoint and the Super Jail, which also unfortunately discharges some people into homelessness. And they, they have nowhere else to go, so they stay around here in their support programs. So it's a blessing and a curse, but... I mean, arguably, it's a blessing for the people who need it, and it's a curse for the people who don't, who just wish that, you know, those people weren't hanging around in front of their stores or downtown bumming smokes. Uh, but it's a reality for us. So I wanted to thank and thank your team for the work and the output that came from the symposium, and we're just getting started, and, we, and our plan is to host another one, basically uh, just to get a report card back from the community. What do you see after a year of all these extra supports from the county? Is it working? 
you know, are we focusing things in the right area? Is the street outreach team um, feel like it's having a difference? And I, I don't know how it couldn't because we have nothing basic. Well, I shouldn't say we have nothing. We have our we have our amazing one person. I think was our resource, um, but which is what we were left with from uh, from Salvation Army. And now we have this organization that does this for a living, right? So not to take away anything Salvation Army was trying to do and continues to do in our community, but you know I really appreciate the effort with the uh, One Community Solutions. Um, a big outfit, Google them if people want to understand what this organization does. And we're getting funding from the county to have them middle. So that's a big thank you. To Councillor McDonald's point, anyone else listening, if you need to connect with any of these services, no one expects you to remember 12 different phone numbers or a litany of uh, websites, 211. Dial those three digits on any phone that has service, and you will get connected to an operator 24-7. They will listen to your tale of woe, what it is you're looking for and need. And if it's anything within their basket of services, they will refer you to the right place and connect you. So that's the one number to call. There will be a, a direct number, I'm sure, to get a hold of One Community Solutions. But in absence of that, two and one, whether you need service because you're needing service or you need service because you're a uh, business and you're dutifully following this stick up thing that they put near the cash register in the break room on what to do if. You know, there's somebody passed out on your um, front stoop or in the back of your alleyway behind your shop. To Councillor Meredith's um, concerns too, I mean, cleanliness downtown, people loitering, this is nothing new. Uh, you know, we have, now we have discarded uh, drug paraphernalia like any community, unfortunately, but we lack the ability uh, to move people along from a public place. I mean, if you're sleeping there with all of your worldly possessions, you're desperately in need of this outreach team see if there's a place we can we can get you or you could just be discharged from the shelter all day as as we discussed you can't just hold them hostage in there they got to go somewhere and a public street is public it's inconvenient it's not always nice to see them there but they're they have every right to be there it's a public street so if they're on your property and you ask them to leave that's a different story but uh, on the sidewalk it's inconvenient it's sad um, but i think we have to look at this from an empathetic standpoint that um you know, we got to deal with it. We're the third most needy in all of Simcoe County. So let's keep this in perspective when we have a few problems on the streets or, you know, a, a mini encampment compared to Aurelia. That's absolutely, you know, I, I would say a wash or lost with their encampments. I'm just counting my lucky stars that we haven't had that problem here. We only have a few tents in the woods and we know who those folks are. So I'm really happy to see this output. Um, this is a, this is community driven. So a big shout out to the our, our community partners who came out to this and to the people um, who are both, you know, upset, demanding what we do more, and also uh, there with their empathy as well that, you know, they understand they want more done, but they also want to help the people that need help. So that's what the output of this is, and I look forward to going public. Um, I did have a couple questions. Indigenous, indigenous services. Right now, the Georgia Bay Native Friendship Center has a van, an outreach van that comes, parks uh, on first and hands out sandwiches and food and and uh, does referrals and I don't know if they do wound care but I'm thinking they there's a basket of, of things they do and I'm wondering are, is is the services you're funding um, supplemental to them or is it them it's fine if we have two but uh, Georgia May Native Friendship Center does have this nice outreach sprinter van and a team of uh, really caring people that help out with food and whatnot do you know if that's something you're sure yep So uh, through you, uh, through the chair, um, thank you for those comments, Mr. Mayor. And I do want to kind of recognize staff and, and you know, and council working together. I, I do think like homelessness is a tough issue, but I do believe uh, and we firmly believe that uh, community based solutions are are the only way forward. And the symposium was a really example, a really good example of that. Um, so Bannock is the umbrella agency that does our outreach. Here in Midland, it's delivered by two smaller agencies, uh, uh, Brock and uh, B, uh, GBNWA. So those are the two agencies. So to answer your question, if it's not those two agencies that you were mentioning, these are net these are two different outreach agencies being funded by us as well as whatever already exists in, in Midland that's not funded by us. And that in you know that's just the indigenous based ones again reminder waypoint is doing the youth outreach and uh, salvation army continues to do 
regular street IHS, it's always done. Great, thanks for that clarification. So that that is actually reassuring because that means there's three three levels of service in our community for our Indigenous population, which is a big part of our community. I mean, it's part of my opening remarks at every meeting, recognizing that. Um, outreach. So thank you, Councillor McDonald, for asking about the motel voucher program administered through Guest House Shelter. That's that's important. No, again, if people aren't sure, you don't have to go knock at the door of Guest House Shelter per se. You can call two on one anytime if you if you have a need for the what motel voucher program MVP they call it. Uh, just call that number. Um, the outreach one community solutions. Are they allowed to come and give a presentation to council and kind of you know tell us? what they do, how they do, and just as an education bit, not only for us, so to help manage our expectations, uh, but also just to generally educate people on what they look like, you know, with their uniforms, here's what you can expect to see. Because I know our, our local media is in, in the audience tonight, and I'm sure he's going to write up some awesome coverage, but it would be really, really neat to have them as a deputation just to kind of share a little bit about their organization and what they've been funded to do and what we can expect to help manage our expectations. To Councillor Meredith's point, what's the limitations? Um, so that we can all know these ahead of time. Through the chair, we can engage them and, you know, see what I'm sure they would be willing to. I can't speak for them. I don't know what their comfort level is with public speaking and public presentations. I imagine they do some in some of the other jurisdictions they've worked in. Um, so I know that where they I find them most effective is at the table with bylaw officers and police services and outreach services working together on like a strategy and, and kind of attending regular meetings and working with shelter providers and others and stakeholders involved, BIA is exactly that. But yeah, I'll certainly, um, you know, we, we can engage the team and see if they're willing to, to come out. I, I would I would suggest maybe speaking with the owners. Um, they tell a really nice story of how the organization came to be and, and some of the experiences they personally have that inspired them to do the work. Um, so yeah, they can share a little bit of the scope of the work and what they're funded to do and not do. Um, I try to differentiate them from outreach. Outreach is really focused on housing-based outcomes and support. They're focused on community safety, and uh, referrals um, and doing some of the like safety cleanups, anything that's tied to safety, uh, they'll uh, set at walks, things like that. That's kind of more their things, engaging people on overdose interventions, uh, those kind of things. So two separate services. Thanks, it would really be awesome to have them come and just, you know, educate us and our, our community on what it's gonna be and it's quite sad, quite, you know, I'll have to say it's sad that we need this and we're having this conversation. This isn't the Midland that a lot of people grew up in, but it, it's our reality. And, uh, you know, nothing we're going to do is going to make this go away. So we need to deal with it and uh, with empathy, compassion, but also, you know, we need to be firm where we need to be firm and uh, caring where we, where we can. So I, I appreciate the blended approach and uh, the good work you guys have been doing and, and this document look forward to being published in the coming days. So thank you. One more follow-up from Councillor Patel. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Mr. Uh, Fias Bugget, sorry for asking all these questions here, but uh, could you just tell us a little bit more about the rent supplement and the landlord damages fund, please? Uh, good question. Thank you, Councillor Patel. Uh, Patel. Um, so the rent supplement program, um, Historically speaking, the provincial government, when they downloaded the services to the service manager, a lot of the, the affordable rent programs were tied to buildings and units. Over time, different types of programs were introduced. Instead of building affordable housing, they would layer a rent allowance or a rent supplement to a private landlord to make that rent affordable for someone. The rent subsidy program is more focused. It comes out of the the homelessness prevention uh, program, which is the fund that we receive significant funding for. It allows us to put funding specifically for people experiencing homelessness to try to reduce down the cost of the rent. And, in, and, and it can operate two ways. You could still engage a landlord and enter an agreement with the landlord to, to, to fund uh, the difference in rent. So for example, if the rent was $1,400, the individual trying to seek that one bedroom can only gets 350 from Ontario Works. There's a delta there. That delta would be a supplement or a subsidy applied to the landlord. So the client's rent um, allowance and 
the subsidy are combined to pay to make the market rent uh, work for the landlord. The other way it could work, some of the Ontario, um, the newer benefits that came from the federal funding programs, federal provincial funding programs combined, allow for a portable subsidy. And this one, basically, it's based on your tax return income. It gives you a, a set calculation saying this is how much you can qualify for. Average is around $700 per person, 600 to 700 depending on their income. Um, and then they can portable, like, take it with them and go find the housing themselves and their responsibilities to pay the landlord through that money they receive and the money they get from whatever um, income based program like Ontario works or ODSP uh, or CPP or, or other, you know, set um, income programs. So the, those are the two ways the subsidies work in either of those cases. We, we administer those either, the, the ones that are portable, we, the county administer them directly through our housing team. The ones that are um, with a third party agent, uh, like landlord, we engage that through Empower Simcoe and those agencies that we give them the funding to then issue those subsidies to the referred pro client experiencing homelessness. Um, sorry, the second question I... I so Empower Simcoe and, and those housing health programs do housing prevention work, uh, in, sorry, eviction prevention work. Um, so this is where someone's at risk maybe of losing housing because of damages, rental arrears, um, utility arrears. So what we try, again, Empower Simcoe, we're trying to avoid people entering the homelessness system uh, as well as those trying to help people exit it. So the rent subsidies help people exit. Some of these eviction prevention tools help them access one-time funding to address an issue to keep them housed rather than them lose their house. Thank you very much. Thank you again for your presentation. It's like you've shone a light at the end of the tunnel for this town. I look forward to good things to come. Thank you. Thank you. Madam CAO. So through the deputy mayor to council, um, just with regards to uh, the the cleanup on the streets, just wanted to give just a bit of context. So um, the the staff at uh, at the op center do collect garbage on the Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during the week, and once more on the weekend. And one of either Saturday or Sunday, depending on what else is on the schedule. And during the winter, that is reduced to twice weekly. So just a, an idea of what the, the op staff does, as well as BIA. The planters and flower beds are, on the other hand, are watered on the daily basis for the entire season. And sp staff are expected to remove any litter during this task so that the beds are checked daily. And um, if we do know that there are large garbage issues or full cans, we report them to the supervisor and the garbage truck or other staff are deployed in addition to the regular garbage days to pick them up. So just wanted to add that a bit more context onto uh, what um, what was previously spoke about. Thank you, Madam CAO. Councillor Meredith. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, through you to uh, uh, CAO one. Um, thank you very much for that uh, update. I did uh, an email this morning. So um, I want to also uh, uh, say that the, the BIA is, um, uh, they'll be hiring their summer student, hopefully in the next week or so. Um, full-time, part-time, Don't I'm not too sure. Um, if it's going to be full-time or part-time, I'm thinking full-time. But anyways, there'll be more uh, active uh, cleanups downtown uh, Midland. So that's the first thing in the morning they do. And then... Um, and then they will be informed if they can't handle that. Some cleanups, they'll uh, direct their uh, um, director uh, the service to uh, to town uh, operations to uh, help them out. So great, thank you.
Okay, we have a second presenter. Um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Cux presenting with regard to the proposed changes to the Young Street Reconstruction Project. And this is a deputation for information purposes only. Uh, welcome. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to begin by thanking Council for providing me the opportunity to speak today on the homeland of the Huron Wendat Nation and Anishinaabek people where I'm fortunate to live, work, and play. Um, my name is Steve Cooks. I'm a resident of Fourth Street in Midland. My son attends Mundy's Bay Public School. My wife, Marianne, is a supply teacher for the Simcoe County District School Board. And for what it's worth, I'm a former transportation policy analyst for the David Suzuki Foundation. Uh, I'm here today to voice my strong opposition to the idea of reverting Young Street back to a four lane road by removing the central turning lane and bike lanes. While I recognize that a decision has not yet been made, uh, the consideration of this as a potential course of action is deeply troubling to me as a person who uses Young Street on a daily basis and who spends time within the community that Young Street represents. There are a myriad of arguments in favor of maintaining the so-called road diet currently in place on Young Street, though I'm not a fan of that term as it implies that building roads with all users in mind could be a temporary, <laughs> a temporary consideration. As Mundy's Bay Principal Chris Harding penned in his letter on behalf of the school's On the Move, on the move Committee, the bike lanes and three lane configuration promote a healthy, uh, promote a ha an active, promote active transportation, pardon me, encourage healthy lifestyles, provide a safer environment for all road users, including those in vehicles, promote accessibility and equity, and are more environmentally sustainable. To that list, I might, al I might also add that providing bike lanes and restricting the number of vehicles along the street is better from an economic point of view as well, since research shows that pedestrians, cyclists, and even those in cars are far more likely to stop and patronize local businesses on a traffic calm street compared to one that encourages high speeds. I've included a link to the study I've taken that conclusion from in my written deposition that I'm happy to circulate to council after this meeting. Uh, and I'm happy to provide other links supporting my other assertions should council require them. But today I'm hoping to speak to you more as a concerned member of the community than as a researcher. Young Street, rather than being a stretch of land that people should be encouraged to speed through in vehicles is a central part of our town for a number of reasons. It runs directly between our largest elementary school and our largest park, places that are set up as gathering locations for people at numerous times throughout the year, as well as being popular places for impromptu recreation. Young Street is home to shops, churches, daycares, a retirement community, and a garden center that just a few weeks ago had countless families queuing up and down the street in anticipation of a free and spectacularly organized Easter egg hunt. Not to mention, most of the buildings on the street are people's actual homes. Any resident of Midland can tell you that Young Street is first and foremost a place where people come together and live, not a conveyance for cars and trucks. It is an important place where life in Midland happens. To see what a mistake it would be to take the step backward of reducing pedestrian and bike access to the street, you need look no further than the section of King Street between Young and Highway 12. It may be tempting to suggest that if the bike lanes were removed, cyclists could ride on the road, but as a person who often chooses to walk or bike for in-town trips, I can tell you that King Street, which is the road that this proposal would essentially emulate, is something that I and many others strongly avoid. Since the day that my pregnant wife was nearly run off the road while biking on King Street, she and I have ridden through Little Lake Park and used the unmaintained off-road connection into Smith's camp to avoid as much of King Street as possible when taking our son to soccer practice at Galloway Park or doing other only as required errands in that end of town. The recently blocked off unofficial trail connecting Smith's camp to the Walmart, Pla Walmart Plaza via Vicks Road is clear evidence that avoiding King Street is common practice for those who choose not to drive. Cyclists who aren't as familiar with our town's unofficial and makeshift bike routes as my wife and I will simply ride on the sidewalk when faced with a four lane road either impeding their own travel or making the sidewalk more dangerous for pedestrians. But you truly can't blame them since biking in a lane meant for cars on a busy four lane street is far more likely to result in someone's death than clipping a pedestrian's shoulder while riding on the sidewalk. 
That situation, while undesirable on King Street, would be a disaster on Young. Twice daily at school pickup and drop off times, the sidewalk is already crowded with pedestrians. In winter, walkers even occasionally have to walk in the bike lanes themselves when sidewalks, sidewalks are not plowed pr prior to the start of school, but that's a topic for another day. Fostering negative experiences by forcing cyclists and walkers to share the sidewalk will only encourage people who are able to use their cars uh, to use them for absurdly short, sh sh <laughs> absurdly short trips of a few blocks because of legitimate safety concerns. This in turn will make traffic on the street worse, which in its own turn will mean that people who do continue to walk either because they're children or because they can't afford or are physically unable to use a car will be forced to breathe in more tailpipe fumes as they weave their way through the inevitable choke points outside the school. The proposal to add more vehicle lanes to Young Street is not good for anyone. Even those in cars would face a more crowded and dangerous route if it were to go ahead. The only justification for it is that maintaining proper separated bike lanes would add maintenance costs when bollards are added and removed in the fall and spring. That cost could also be avoided if we invested in permanent cycling infrastructure, but that again is another issue. I'm here all but begging council not to demonstrably make the town a worse place to live to save money. I abhor needless spending as much as the next taxpayer, I truly do. But as someone who my wife would certainly tell you is guilty of overly frugal decision-making around hotel rooms and such on road trips, less costly rarely means more, live, <clears throat> more pleasant to live in and is far more likely to mean off-putting or unsafe. As we grow, we need to think about the future. That involves putting people who live and spend time in and spend time and money in different parts of our town ahead of the vehicles that pass these places by. It means thinking about students, teachers, seniors, business owners, employees, and of course the residents who live on Young as the street's primary users, not the cars speeding past. The current configuration is a step in the right direction, but further improving pedestrian and cycling access must be the goal. The four lane proposal is a clear step backward that I implore you to reject. One concerned resident I, of Young Street I spoke to in preparing this deposition also asked me to include a reminder that the traffic calming measures currently in place were meant to slow traffic and prevent vehicles from speeding as much uh, as <clears throat> speeding by as they pass each other, uh, in addition to improving multimodal access. In that regard, the measures have been a success. The final thing I will add is that while I applaud the idea of collecting community feedback on this issue, I have some concerns about the poll being conducted on the mayor's website. Uh, any consultation statistics used in the decision-making process ought to be collected through the town's channels. As a researcher, I genuinely understand the impulse to use the tools most readily available to collect data, uh, but the transparency and validity concerns of this poll uh, mean that it should only inspire a poll conducted by the town itself that reaches a more representative audience. Once again, I ask you to build our town for people, not cars. Help make our community a safer, more pleasant place to live by preserving the bike lanes and three lane configuration on Young. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Councilor McDonald? Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Cook. 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 Cooks. Yeah. Cooks. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm sure you've been that your name has been mispronounced more than once. It's a lifelong struggle. <laughs> um the I would like a copy of your presentation and um I totally support what you're proposing. Our our big decision will be um to the ideal would be a multi-use lane. That would be wonderful. We'd have to convince our uh, council to invest in the future with that. It was brought to my, I'm, I'm not asking a question, I'm making more of a comment. I'll get a question in there somehow, so I'm not disallowed. Um, people come to Midland, they're not bypassing Midland. When they head this way, it's the end of the road, Midland Penetang. So if we can announce and promote that we're a bike-friendly 
community will not only, because now we can ride 93 to Midland from 12, um, we'll, we will attract more cyclists. Do you believe that? I, I, I do. Yes, well done. <laughs> but, um, no, and uh, the, the addition of the bike lane along Highway 93 is, is a great step. It's a recognition of the difference between roads and streets, roads being conveyances between two places and streets being the destinations themselves. And having the, the bike lane be completely separated and safe year-round uh, along Highway 93 is, is a fantastic step. Having more protected bike infrastructure within town would would certainly attract more people. It would support the businesses downtown that uh, specialize in renting bikes. It's a, kind of a growing, growing thing in town that I'm happy to see. But uh, speaking personally, uh, prior to moving to Midland, my wife and I lived in Vancouver for six years, and we're both from Ontario originally. We were looking for a place to to come back to. Neither of us had had roots in Midland before six years ago. Uh, but what attracted us was the town's small town feel, the ability to walk to, to different shops. Again, I mentioned we live on 4th Street, so we can pop down to, to the shops that uh, the BIA works with and uh, yeah, pick up groceries as needed and things like that. So that kind of a feel and that kind of accessibility and the, the freedom to choose our mode of transportation for trips in town is was a huge draw for us. And I, I would think it would be a huge draw for others as well. Thank you. Councillor Meredith. Thank you, uh, and thank you for your presentation, Mr. Cooks. And uh, I've received uh, plenty of uh, emails and phone calls on this about uh, just leaving the the road alone uh, as is, and um, and and not spending uh, any more uh, going into bike lanes. And 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 option. I think the option three was. Uh, I imagine you looked at all the options. Um, so if I were to put you up. Uh, and question you, what what option are you, are you looking at as as the best option? I'm thinking uh, the most expensive one, by but <laughs> I, I mentioned I, I I am not a huge fan of just spending money for the sake of spending money. Uh, I I understand that there are infrastructure needs right now with regard to Young, and that's kind of what sparked this conversation to begin with, and that. There is a requirement now that when the road is repaved, that bollards be installed, installed to protect the bike lanes. I think that would be the the next logical step. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, a long term vision, having the bike lanes be separated up on the the boulevards or protected by permanent curbs would be obviously the the ideal solution. Um, speaking as as somebody who again chooses to cycle and walk in town. Uh, having the protected bollards and maintaining the bike lanes and the three lane configuration is is far preferable to to losing them. So that's again what sparked me to to come here is just concern over that idea of the step backwards rather than I I have faith in council to choose a bike lane configuration that is is best for the town and satisfies our requirements and and our budget and things like that. I just want to preserve the ability to to choose different modes of transportation especially around the school as, as my son's only four years old as he gets as he gets older i want to have him be able to bike to school and not think about the what could happen thank you thank you very much and um i was i i was brought up on young street and, and we biked on that four lane uh road and biked on the sidewalks went to park view now it's uh Monday's Bay, but um, but yeah, I, I appreciate uh, in uh, your deputation, and uh, we'll take that into consideration for sure. Thank you, Mayor Gordon. Thanks for your presentation. Um, it 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 echoes a lot of the feedback we're getting right now um, by email, like and including an email that unfortunately I don't think council's seen yet. It'll be on our our council information package for the next round, but it's the one from. Uh, the, the principal. I tried to follow up with them today to acknowledge receipt, but I sent an email because I couldn't get them on the phone. So I 100% hear what you're saying. And I just I wanted to address two things because, um, of course, our objective when we hear these deputations is not to engage in debate or we're not certainly not a decision making uh, at, tonight at all. The the concept of the straw poll, I just want to speak to that on my website. So community engagement is a foundational issue with me. And so I routinely engage if you interact on Facebook. 
I don't, I don't think there's anybody more engaged with people on Facebook than I am. Well, I'm probably some counselors that are close, but I, I probably can wear the crown for that one. So I will talk to people online, Facebook. I will debate with them. I will pull facts out. I will call, you know, things out that are wrong. I'll do that in person when I'm shopping. I take phone calls, my cell phone's all over the place. People just call me at all hours of the day and want to talk or they Facebook message me. So the poll on my website that I choose to host on my own is just another engagement technique. It's not anything official by the town of Midland and it's not meant to usurp or, or replace any efforts the town does through their public information center. It's, it's just me asking the question and people answered. Um, you know, I'm not, I won't even tell you what the ratio is between the, the two options that I asked for uh, feedback on. I, I will share that at, at some point, but you know, my point is not to try and, you know, upset the process. I, I lobbied for and council approved having that report pushed back to include one more option and through our debate at council and we have two options now um, coming back to us. And so we just deferred the decision-making. And of course, I already apologize for <laughs> to Mr. Sobel on being able to, able to to show and tell, as it were, uh, what he was going to, you know, what the what the actual recommendation from staff was. So to me, it was just that opportunity lost, and that was the rationale for sending it back um, to come back with the numbers because that was missing too, uh, and whether or not putting it back to the way it is now, the three lanes, if bollards are actually a, like a nice to have, you know, it's something the province says, you know, you you should do this, but you don't have to. That opens up a lot of opportunities for us if it's a nice to do and not a must do the way it was characterized as we had to do it and we had to spend that money again i didn't i'm glad we didn't make a decision that night because i would have voted against it because i'm not gonna I couldn't put that on the taxpayer i'm glad it's coming back with all of the options now and we're getting this chance to hear from the community and deputations uh, like yourself and feedback but i also need to um remind you that back in 2017 when this was being proposed just before my first term there was a petition with thousands of names or not a thousand, probably a thousand names on it that didn't want the road diet from local Midland residents that wanted it to stay as it was for 30 or 40 years as a four lane road. So we can't uh, ignore the, and we did, or we didn't council of the day didn't, wasn't persuaded by all those names and decided to move ahead with the road diet. So listening to the community and responding to what the community says um, they want is totally our job. And that's why we're doing this. And I want you to know that your view on this and the other people that share that is valuable to us. And that, as I alluded to earlier, the decision is far from made. And that all we want is to have all the options on the table, even the ones that aren't necessarily unpleasant or that are unpleasant to people that are very happy with the way it is. The last thing I wanted to speak to is the common denominator I'm hearing imploring us not to you know, turn this thing into a highway. Um, I think largely from people maybe who didn't live here for the decades when it was four lanes is that speeding in our community is a really big problem that this council takes seriously. And while you don't have the ability to post OPP cars all over town to do radar, so we are going to be putting in speed enforcement cameras, automated speed enforcement. We're well on our way to getting the framework in place to do that. And I could tell you that, you know, normally you're not supposed to be biased and tell you what your opinion is, but Young Street is high on my priority. No matter what we do with Young, whether it stays the same it, the way it is, or we spend 15 million on you know, a completely separate lane and that, you know, basically take people's front lines and turn it into sidewalk, which is what we'd have to do to, to make that separate lane. I would still say we need cameras, speed enforcement cameras on Young to slow the traffic down because it's 50, it's supposed to be 50 during the day. And when those lights are flashing for the kids in school, it's supposed to be 40. And if we had cameras there, we can enforce that every single day of the week, whether there's police in town or not. And tickets go out, expensive tickets, to the vehicle's owner and we can change behaviors. So we're, I don't want you to think for a second that you know we're looking at regressing or turning this thing into a speedway. Uh, we're not. That is, it won't be one of the options. And no matter what we end up doing with this road, uh, traffic enforcement for speed is a high priority for council, high priority for me. And we're really pushing hard to get these automated speed enforcement cameras in our community. And I would argue Young Street is a is a good candidate there's some several others too that have speeding problems but i just wanted to leave you with the, the your, your point about safety and concerns about speed whether it's the current configuration or any future configuration are well placed and i didn't want to leave those unaddressed so thank you for your presentation tonight thank you very much councillor patel 
through the deputy mayor. Thank you for that presentation, uh, Mr. Cox. You know, as a parent, with my son, he's he's been born in Midland, and we never used the streets like you're concerned about. But the Tay Trail, he's basically grown up on, and we bike that pretty much every day, even, you know, till now. Uh, we don't do it much because he's a teenager, and I've lost him on that trail. Um, but that's a great option for young families to use um, uh, for the safety concern on, you know, Young Street and King Street. Uh, even with the Ballards, um, you know, the safety is still maybe not there. That's just my concern. Thank you. Councilor Meredith. Well, thank you. I just a uh, comment to Mayor Gordon's uh, a comment that the, the speed calming cameras, um, they're not coming. I b believe we're going to have a discussion about that and it has to pass through council, but it, it, it's coming to council in a report, I guess, or something, but they're they're not officially coming just to, just to make sure that our, our phones are blowing, blowing up here and uh, something that, uh, um, you know, some public will love it. Some, some pipe, some of them will not just like the bike lanes, right. Or the young street, uh, going back to four lanes. So just wanted to make that clear that, um, that's still, uh, uh, to be decided, but, um, but it is, um, definitely a, a solution to the, the speeding issues on, on young street because of, uh, the lack of, um, OPP enforcement, uh, that we have in our town. Thank you. Yeah, and may I respond to uh, Councillor Patel? Uh, for sure, and and I I'm not concerned that uh, the opportunity to ride bicycles or is, is going away or anything like that. With, with regards to the the safety issue, I, I completely agree that the bollards don't fix any or don't fix all the safety problems associated with with cycling along the street. And related to the the idea of speed cameras and enforcement, I think that's obviously a, a very necessary step as somebody who lives on 4th Street. We've had speeding issues that uh, you were all too too aware of, I'm sure. I, I just, I strongly feel, and the, the research suggests that that building environments that nudge people into slower speeds and uh, force people to consider the, the option or consider the way that they're driving, um, maybe not as consciously as seeing a speed camera or an OPP officer waiting in their car with, with a radar gun, things that influence things a little bit more subtly um, are more effective on a broader scale. That's what I would say. And thank you so much for your comments and again for the time. Councillor Ball. Thank you. Yeah, so this, there were two options to go through uh, having staff come back to, with the report for the four lanes, but also for a multi-use trail. So there will be safety in mind. Um, I certainly have talked to several members of the community um, and I appreciate your presentation as well with people that are echoing your concerns. So uh, we are hearing them and there are complete opposite ends of the spectrum coming back to us. So we will be reviewing every option. So I just want to make that clear. We haven't made a decision and that every option will be available and safety is definitely a priority for everyone up here. Uh, Councillor McDonald had asked for you to send um, some further information. Would you mind providing that to all of council, please? Absolutely. And thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we're on to 16. Uh, committee, local board, delegation, or memo. There are none. 17, reports and other items withdrawn from the consent agenda for council's consideration includes presentations and consultants regarding a report under consideration. No reports were pulled. Um, notice of motion, I do have one, so I'd like to hand the floor over to Mayor Gordon. Very good, go ahead. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, I'd like to put a notice of motion on the floor for um, 
a bylaw for feeding um, birds and animals in private backyards, I will provide proper wording to the clerk for the next meeting. I just want to put it on the floor that it is coming. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Madam Clerk, is that good enough for you? You'll we'll wordsmith something so it'll be on the agenda at our meeting in three weeks, and we can debate it then. Fantastic. Thank you. You're done. Oh, go ahead, Councillor Meredith. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, I I have uh, two. Uh, Notice of motions, and I haven't. Uh, I'll work on with uh, the clerk to uh, on the uh, the language, the correct uh, language. Um, but I want to introduce a vacancy fee on uh, um, or tax or however you, you want to word it on uh, vacant buildings in our downtown core. Um, there is one. There there are a couple right now, but there's one has been vacant for quite a long time, and. Uh, I'm not sure if it ever be uh, um, filled. So the BIA has uh, talked about this uh, on a number of times. So I want to introduce a, a vacancy fee um, in our downtown uh, buildings. Um, and I'll word it with uh, our clerk. Uh, the second one, I also want to introduce a, a peddling bylaw on um, possibly look into it into uh, in, in our downtown core as well. Um, if it goes outside our down, downtown courts. Um, but I think right now, um, if we have a bylaw uh, of peddling, it might solve some of the, the immediate problems we're having downtown. Um, and I know it's a long-term solution as uh, Mr. Fayez had stated in his, uh, and, and even at AMO last year when um, a number of our councillors were at AMO. Councillor Maris, sorry. Yeah. Um, we're so, just putting the motion on the floor. Okay. We'll debate it next next meeting. Oh, sorry. Okay. Stay tuned for next next meeting then. Thank you. So, thank you. Through, through your worship, just to acknowledge that we will uh, have wording and work with you on the wording on this as well as the deputy mayor's um, Notice of motion and have it ready for the next council. Nineteen general announcement. Um, does anybody have any announcements? Councillor Ball. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, talk about the bowling for kids that Big Brothers Big Sisters is putting on. Um, lots of members of our community are participating, including Midland Council. Uh, we have challenged the other councils around our area to come to the table and also participate. So hopefully they will. Um, and I hope that anyone who can give some spare money either to our team or to any team participating, it's for a great cause. So if you want any details, it's very readily available and uh, we're, you can come cheer us on or uh, support us in any way you can and, uh, and I'll support the organization overall. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Mayor Gordon. Thanks, I'm always, you can always count on me for two. Um, so I've got the, uh, well, actually I've got more than two tonight, the community grants program, uh, $40,000 in the pot available for 2020 to 24. And the applications close on Monday, April 15th. So that's five days from now at noon, uh, visit midland.ca slash grants for information on eligibility and how to apply. And then a little spoiler alert for next year, we discussed this at budget. Um, my goal is I'm, I'm trying to put together a little group to help me, uh, a citizen group to help me with the first annual, hopefully it's an annual mirrors golf tournament. I'm, I'm taking the, you know, the, uh, hint from Tay and tiny who do really well on this and all of the proceeds from that golf tournament. And I'm terrible at golf. So don't expect any great things from me on this one, but all the proceeds from the tournament, cause there's gonna be people there who don't suck at golf, who come to it are all going to go into the community grants uh, program. And the objective is that that $40,000 of tax money that we're giving away this year, will become $40,000 coming in through the golf tournament rather than on the taxpayers. So that's my goal. So this is my little shout out. I did put something on social media and on the web. Anybody that has any experience at all running and organizing a golf tournament, for the love of God, please get a hold of me because this is not the guy. 
Um, I'll do all kinds of work, but I can't go hustling for prizes and shaking people down for money because that's frowned on in the Municipal Act. So I definitely need the help. And I know I have some volunteers on council to help me, but they're in the same boat. So if you have any experience doing this, please reach out to me. Uh, the idea here is not to try and leverage staff who are busy enough. I'm trying to do this with the community because it is community grants. Anyway, that's my pitch uh, for the community grant program. There's also for the artistic folk among us, of which, which Midland is blessed. There are two amazing opportunities right now. There's mural restoration. So the town's home to, of course, 30 historic murals located in downtown in the waterfront area. And we're looking to contract mural, mural artists to restore some of the murals in 2024 and into 2025. The deadline for artists to apply is Friday, April 29th at 4.30 p.m. And check midland.ca slash artists for details. So again, we're restoring them, not like making new ones over top of them. So people that are handy with a paintbrush uh, and artistic, please apply because we desperately need your help. And these historic murals are something that um, puts us on the map, quite frankly. If we were to lose like the one on the green elevator, Midland Harbor would not be recognizable to most people that visit here. Uh, there's also the Community Mural Program. The town's hosting its inaugural Midland Mural, mural Festival on Saturday, September 28th. So in the fall, we'll invite the community to help paint a mural. The artists will be selected to design and outline the mural for public to paint on September 28th. So an artist is going to do the design. It's like color by numbers, maybe. And uh, the regular schmoes in town like me with my non-artistic brush will be able to fill in some of them. And in the end, it might look wonderful um, with my small contribution and yours too. So the deadline for artists to apply is Friday, April 29th at 4.30 p.m. And check midland.ca slash artists. Again, same page. Then a couple of proclamations, April 22nd uh, is Earth Day. So the town will proclaim April 22nd is Earth Day and in recognizing uh, Earth Day's Canada's efforts to help individuals, municipalities, organizations reduce our impact on the environment, all Canadians and emerging Midlanders to take part in Earth Day, Canada's leg day on Monday, April 22nd by walking, biking, uh, or taking public transit to work as opposed to driving the, the automobile. Uh, the town of Midland also appreciates the work of our operations crew who work every day to keep Midland's parks, community gardens, roads, sidewalks, including the downtown, um, clean and for all to enjoy. And the BIA, got to throw them in there too because they're a big part of that. And lastly, April 28th is a National Day of Mourning for persons killed or injured in the workplace. I wish we didn't have to celebrate this, but we do. The town recognizes this important day with a proclamation every year where we remember and honor those who lost their lives or were injured due to a workplace tragedy and we also collectively renew our commitment to improve the health and safety in, in the workplace and prevent further injuries, illnesses, and God forbid, death. A flag ceremony will be held Friday, April 26th. Um, all of, anyone's invited to come. I always encourage council to come to these, and most of you do, where flags at Town Hall will be half-masted. Flags at the municipal buildings will also be half-masted. So please join me if you can. And if you can't, then just join us in recognizing the, the many people that are killed every year in their workplace. They go to work, but they don't come home or they don't come home the same. Thank you. Councilor McDonald. Thank you, um, Deputy Mayor Prost. Um, through you to the mayor, thank you for that extensive list. I was looking for the one about bicycling that I think was on your post event. Could you remind me of that one? Because... Thank you. If someone else can find it faster than me, Madam CEO, I do have it on my Facebook page and, and my website, but it is a cycle tourism is a big deal in, in Simcoe County and in Midland. So take it away. We're hosting. We're the host of the most, as it were. We are. So through your worship, um, I should get my glasses on. We are um, hosting in partnership with the County of um, Simcoe and other North Simcoe municipalities. And um, the information has is being shared right now on the BIA Chamber of Commerce, local accommodations and attractions and transportation committees. But it is on Friday, April the 26th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the North Simcoe Sports and Rec Center, which is at 527 Len South Boulevard, Midland. So you can pre-register and um, I, we have the link on our, on our website and I'll just tell you it, it's uh, destination bike, but it is on our website. 
and it is again in partnership and so it's a cycle tourism destination development workshop is uh, jointly offering this so thank you you're welcome Okay, we're on to 20. And I have a motion on the floor to uh, close the Committee of the Whole and resume formal council session. That's resolution number 2024-135, moved by Councillor McDonald, seconded by Councillor Patel, that the Committee of the Whole rise and report. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Alrighty, welcome back to Council. We've got a motion here moved by Councillor Meredith, seconded by Deputy Mayor Prost. The recommendation of the Committee of the Whole for the meeting of April 10th, 2024, 2024 be adopted as resolutions of Council. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. And moving right into the bylaws, and we're almost done. Moved by Councillor Balt, seconded by Councillor Balt, that bylaw 2024-27 being a bylaw to enter into an agreement with Randy Bedan carrying on business as Huronia Animal Control and to repeal bylaw 2015-14 and bylaw 2018-17 be passed and enacted. All those in favor? And opposed? It's carried. Next move by Deputy Mayor Prost, seconded by Councillor McDonald, the bylaw 2024-28 being a bylaw to adopt the proceedings of this regular council meeting with closed session held April 10th, 2024 be passed and enacted. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. And last but not least, Moved by Councillor Patel, seconded by Councillor Downer, that this regular meeting of council with closed session adjourn at 8.11 p.m. All those in favor? You opposed? It's carried. And we are adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>